This video provides an overview of Ritornello form. First, we'll discuss Ritornello terms and definitions. Then we'll briefly mention different genres that are frequently in Ritornello form. And finally, we'll spend the bulk of our time looking at the first movement of Vivaldi's Cello Concerto in G minor, RV417. So what is Ritornello form? Ritornello comes from the word ritorno, which means return. Ritornello form alternates two types of sections. The first is the ritornello, from which the form gets its name. This refers to the recurring thematic material that is interleaved throughout the piece. This is highlighted most frequently by featuring the 2D instrumental ensemble. The other type of section is the solo sections, which contrast the ritornellos, both in terms of thematic content frequently and more importantly, in terms of instrumentation. So these solo sections, as the name suggests, will feature a soloist or a solo group. The number of sections varies from one piece to another. So the exact number of ritornello sections and solo sections depends on the piece, it depends on the scope of the piece, and it depends a little bit on the genre. Typically, however, there'll be one more ritornello section than there will be solo sections because the ritornello will usually start and end the piece. It's productive to compare rondo and ritornello form because they have some interesting similarities, but they also have some important differences. Just as a rondo form alternates refrains and episodes, a ritornello form alternates ritornello and solo sections. Just as in a rondo, some statements of the refrain may be shortened, it's also frequent for the ritornello to be shortened in later statements, especially statements in the middle of the piece. There's an important difference in terms of expected key areas, though. In a rondo, the refrain is expected to recur in the tonic key. There are a few exceptions, but by and large, the refrain is tied to the tonic. In a ritornello structure, however, the middle statements of the ritornello are often in a key other than tonic. Given that ritornello form was most popular in the Baroque era, those middle statements are typically in a closely related key. Another difference has to do with instrumentation. In a rondo form, the refrain and the episodes have more or less the same instrumentation. In contrast, the ritornello forms most frequently do feature a drastic change in texture and instrumentation between the ritornello sections and the solo sections. So the ritornello features the entire orchestra, and the contrasting sections will feature a soloist or a particular group. The specific group that is featured varies a little bit according to genre, so let's go through some of the common Baroque ritornello genres. Probably the most well-known is the solo concerto, where one instrument is the soloist and then is set in contrast to the orchestra. Ritornello form is particularly common in outer movements of solo concertos. Another type of concerto that is popular in the Baroque era is the concerto grosso. Now there's actually two types of concerto grossi. The first type, which is probably the slightly better known of the two, features a small group of instruments that together acts as the solo group that is referred to as the concertino group, as opposed to the ripieno, which refers to the tutti ensemble. So in a concerto grosso, the concertino is featured in the solo sections and the ripieno is featured in the tutti ritornello sections. There is a second type of concerto grosso in which there isn't quite so much contrast between instrument groups. This type focuses on statements of the main theme without such drastic changes in orchestration. Some chorus movements are ritornello forms. Um, in this case, the choir acts as the so-called solo group as opposed to the instrumental ritornellos that are played by the orchestra. This is particularly common in box cantatas. And last but not least, the da capo aria frequently features some version of a ritornello structure. Now, in this case, it's a little bit more complicated in that the ritornello form is combined with a ternary form, hence the name da capo aria. Usually there's a big A section that's tonally closed, a contrasting B section that is tonally open, and then, of course, the da capo takes it back to the original A section. In this case, of course, the vocalist is serving as a soloist, and the instrumental accompaniment is the part that is playing the ritornello. Next, let's take a look at Vivaldi's Cello Concerto in G minor, RV417, the first movement. 
This piece is in the key of G minor. You might be a little surprised if you look at the score though. The score uses a signature of one flat, so it's actually the G Dorian key signature. Key signatures were not standardized until the mid to late 18th century, and so it's not uncommon for Baroque pieces to have one more or one fewer accidentals in the key signature than we would expect with our modern standardized version. This particular piece features five ritornello sections and four solo sections. Again, the exact number of ritornellos and solos will vary from one movement to another, but this particular movement has five ritornellos and four solo sections. Another thing you might notice if you look at the score for this piece is that the solo cellist doubles the orchestral celli in the 2D passages. In some cases, actually, in performance, the solo cellist might be the only cello in the ensemble, in which case, of course, it has to play in the 2D passages as well. Let's take a look at the first ritornello. This first ritornello has four main thematic ideas within it. The first, which I'm going to call idea A, establishes the key of G minor. It basically vacillates back and forth between tonic and dominant chords. The second section features repeated neighbor notes in the violins, kind of trading back and forth between violin one and violin two. The third section, which I'm going to call idea C, features a descending circle of fifth sequence. And the fourth and final idea, idea D here, features sigh figures and eventually leads to a perfect authentic cadence. Let's listen to this opening ritornello. <laughs> Now let's put that opening ritornello into context. This slide shows a form diagram of the entire movement. As you can see, there are five ritornello sections. Each of those ritornello sections are different in terms of length and content. So the first ritornello is the only one that actually has all four of those ideas that we just heard. So you can see Ritornello 2 pulls out A and C, Ritornello 3 has C, Ritornello 4 has A, and the Ritornello 5 picks up the B, C, and D. Each of these Ritornellos starts and ends in the same local key. Not all of them are in tonic, but my point here is that the Ritornellos themselves do not modulate internally. 2 and 3 are in closely related keys. Number 2 is in D minor, the minor dominant. Number 3 is in B flat major, the major median. And one thing that's interesting about this construction is that if you take Ritornello 4 and 5 together, they include all four of the ideas. So Ritornello 4 has A and Ritornello 5 has the other three ideas. So the four that are introduced in Ritornello 1 and G minor at the beginning of the piece do come back in G minor at the end of the piece. The only difference is that in between idea A and idea B is a solo section. And only Ritornello 4 ends with a half cadence. Part of it is again because of that interpolation of the solo section. There are four solo sections. Only the first of these borrows material directly from the ritornello. As you can see, solo one begins with a little bit from idea A, but it then spins off into solo material. Most of these solo sections start and end in different keys. So for example, solo one starts in G minor and modulates to D minor. Solo two starts in D minor modulating to B flat, and solo three starts in B flat modulating to G minor. The exception is solo four, which is in G minor from start to finish. Most of these feature one or more sequences. This is not surprising given the fact that these solo sections modulate. Again, in the Baroque era, modulation typically was done through the means of a modulating sequence. And so let's take a closer look at that. Solo one incorporates two sequences. First, the ascending five six, and then the descending circle of fifths.
The third solo passage likewise incorporates an ascending 5-6 sequence. <laughs> And solo four once again incorporates an ascending 5-6 sequence. This version is particularly interesting due to the chromaticized bass line. So in summary, Ritornello form most typically relies on contrast in theme and instrumentation, alternating 2D and solo passages. Again, there are a couple of exceptions to this, but by and large, if you have a Ritornello structure, there's going to be contrast in both theme and instrumentation between the Ritornello and solo sections. All or part of the Ritornello may occur in keys other than tonic in the interior of the movement. We saw that with the Vivaldi example that we talked about. The solo sections are more likely to modulate than the ritornello sections, and those solo sections, when they do modulate, often modulate through sequence. Ritornello form shapes both instrumental concertos and select vocal works in the Baroque era. So in this particular video, we concentrated on an opening movement from one of Vivaldi's many solo concerti, but this particular process also applies to many other Baroque genres.